Max Grande London um, 2018 and right now I am with two of the keynote speakers which is Dave West, hey. hi Dave, and Alan Brown. Now they've both given some really inspirational um, talks just now which are also very insightful but um, before we continue I'm just going to let them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about themselves so please introduce yourself. Hi I'm Dave West, I'm CEO product owner at Scrum.org. And I'm Alan Brown, I'm a director of a research group at the University of Surrey. Awesome, so I don't know how this is going to go, <laughs> for obvious reasons, but... <laughs> obvious <laughs> reasons? What does that mean? <laughs> well, they, were, they weren't there, right? So it's like, yeah, this, like people say downstairs, having you two together is going to be interesting. So <laughs> we're going to figure it out and see how this goes. We're going to work in an agile way. We're going to work in an agile way and we're going to, yeah. Deal with some uncertainty. So, first of all, you gave some talk about digitalization and the impact that it's having on the world, but you also spoke specifically about data and uh, some of the concerns and implications around it and some grounds that we just don't really know what's going to happen. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so uh, the, the first thing is I tried to separate two things one is digitalization, okay. and the other is digital transformation. Right, okay. And digitalization is we're trying to make things more digital. Yep. And typically that's an, an operational issue, it's a, an efficiency issue, it's an automation issue. And then digital transformation is, if we can do that, mm. can we think differently, can we work mm. differently? Mm. And particularly as things are starting to create a kind of digital footprint, mm. it becomes more interesting. So let's take a simple example, here's a pen. Yep. I can put technology in the pen, and essentially what I can do is create a digital wrapper around this analog device. Mm. And I can do that for any analog device. And once I do that, the digital wrapper tells me where this thing is, how much ink is in it, which angle it's at, who's holding it, because I can maybe detect your fingerprints. Right, okay, I wow. can detect when it's used, maybe I can detect what you're writing. I can connect this to every other pen. Okay. I can then start to understand what you're doing with it, why you're doing it, how often you're doing it, who else is doing it at the same time. And that means I can start to get information that can completely change how we order this, how we manage it, how we replenish the ink, how we connect with your supply chain, and in fact, what this thing is for in terms of the value. If I'm writing a novel, that's different than if I'm taking a form, than if I'm using it to open up something. You know, the, the value is in what it's used for. Mm -hmm. And once we understand what it's used for, when it's used, how often it's used, who you're with when you use it, mm -hmm then I can start to think about this thing in a completely different way. Mm. And that's the difference. And it's even more crazy than that, Alan, because then that pen might work with something else that you have. Absolutely. So somebody else has opened up, you know, they've maybe put, maybe it's a TV. And because the pen and the TV know about each other in such a way, you can start capturing more stuff. You can maybe electronically start writing on that TV. Mm -hmm. And then the TV is connected to something else. And it's sort of like snowballs in this sort of very mm. network kind of model. Mm. So suddenly you might be Bic who create a fabulous pen yeah. and you do some amazing things. Suddenly there's a, a business that connect that pen to other things mm. that's built on your platform. Mm. You then can start getting some insights from that, which then drive both R&D and society mm. groups and communities. So, so the data is interesting, but it, it's not the data that's so interesting. It's what the data is telling us about your life, about the context, about what you're doing, about why you're doing it, and, and the historical, what you were doing and what you're doing now and what you will be doing. Mm. And then we're in a different world. And I mm. think digitization is we can put some information so that we can gather a footprint of this pen. Mm. Digital transformation is now I can completely revolutionize what I do, how I do it, who I work with, how I value it, um, how I think about myself in relationship to society and business and, and the world. And so that, that's bullet mind blowing. It is mind blowing, it's very interesting. So on one level, from a commercial aspect, it provides lots of opportunities for creating products and services and creating value, which you spoke about, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But on the other end, it provides a very scary possibility of what does the democracy, right? Yeah. We've seen what happened with Cambridge and Analytics and Trump and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. If all that information is being collected, you're speaking about connection to other devices, which is your internet of things, right? And you also spoke about who owns the data, then all of a sudden it's like, well, yeah. What so it's, it's one of those two-sided things, <clears throat> with power comes responsibility, you know, it's that classic mm -hmm. dilemma. Mm -hmm. And so, so one of the things they talk about is they talk about the personalization privacy paradox. And the, the dilemma here is that we can know more about and we can personalize, which means we can do great new things. Yeah. But we also have a responsibility then about the privacy and the use of that information, mm -hmm. so that it's moral and ethical, so that it's legal, 
so that it is for positive use rather than for negative use. Mm -hmm. And that paradox is, is one we're all going through right now. Mm -hmm. What are we willing to share to get what back? Mm -hmm. The problem we've got right now is that isn't a very transparent process at all. It, arguably, it's incredibly one-sided. Mm -hmm. That Lots of the commercial organizations, and in some cases state and government organizations, have the power and the individuals don't. Yes. And I think the struggle we're seeing from all sorts of, uh, of, of quarters is because that power struggle is going on and it's not really understood where this is going to go. Mm. And that, this is why I, I described in the talk, we're not really in a technical war or a technical battle, we're in a political and a societal battle because this is going to reshape the way we think about ourselves and work. Um, we talked talk about the future of work, uh, how we think about society, the role of democracy, the role of community. We're really in some interesting times. Yeah, and what, what, what's kind of interesting, I mean, this isn't a new problem. Obviously, the first IBM computer, you could argue, was used for a very evil purpose in terms of the German census in, what was it, 1936, or whatever it was, which that data was then used to exterminate a very large percentage of the population. Right? So it's not the first time, but the, but the issue we have now is that the scale and magnitude and the speed mm -hmm. that these things are happening is incredible. Mm -hmm. You know, suddenly, so Fitbit, great example, fabulous organization, we've all got Fitbits. Mm -hmm. You know, they're great, great, you know, helps motivate, provide empirical data on your exercise, fabulous. And, you know, saving lots of lives every day by encouraging people to get fitter. Steps is a great mechanism, yeah. right? But remember how that data was used by Al-Qaeda and, uh, and ISIS. They could see, because most troops, because most people that are in the army or air force are very into being fit. So they, of course, followed the trend and they use Fitbit. And Fitbit promote that data and share it in a very open and transparent way. So suddenly you could see troop movements. Right. Now, now, so it just shows you that, that, and that wasn't planned, and Fitbit certainly didn't plan that. They're an awesomely, very moral, also very caring company. I mean, their mission is about getting people fitter through more transparency, right? I mean. Uh, and um, so it's really interesting that, that moral kind of perspective. And the problem I see is that the social systems that we have in place, organizations and governments are the biggest examples, but also churches and other institutions, are not able to deal with the speed. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I, and, and maybe this is a plug, but maybe we need to you know, bring Scrum and Agile to these organizations yeah, because what they need to be able to do is, like, this change is going to happen with or without them. Yeah. If it, if it happens without them, there's a chance that it could do great harm, you know. Mainframes and computers have added a lot of value in the world, you know, they've you know, solved many diseases and, and helped people, but they've also been used to blow things up, nuclear bombs are only created because of computing power, all of this sort of stuff. So now without that government that's working at an appropriate speed, we're going to get into trouble. And I think that's kind of what we were also talking about, the ethical, the society implications around that. And that was actually a good kind of um, move on to what I was going to ask next. So we live in a complex adaptive world. We're talking yeah. about technologies that as they converge, it's going to just make things a lot more complex. Even just the example you spoke about, the possibilities, mm -hmm. we don't know. How can Scrum um, specifically help to, well, there's the moral part of it and the ethical part of it, but how can it help for us to create some, some real value and so, quickly? And, and, and it's interesting that Alan said something in his talk that I was like, oh, I haven't heard it said like that. He said that, what Scrum provides us with is a level of discipline around it, a structure, I think we may have used the word structure, and I added discipline. Mm -hmm. So ultimately what it does is it provides us a mechanism, it, it provides clear roles, the three key roles of Scrum. It provides us with uh, the sprint review, which increases transparency and gets the right people involved, it, with the retrospective to improve the concepts of transparency, mm -hmm. inspection and adaption through transparency, the daily Scrum where you make things. So what I hope is that, and, and I believe that Scrum gives you a great tool and the Agile approach gives you a great set of tools to basically navigate in this complex world. Right, okay. But I hope from an ethical point of view. So we, interestingly, the values, the five values of Scrum were added, well, they, they've always been there, but they were added back two years ago to the Scrum Guide, in part because, for very selfish reasons, because if you've not got that value system in place, transparency drops. Mm -hmm. When you don't trust each other, when you aren't courageous about showing, you know, we're not open, when you don't, not, don't commit to the process, transparency drops and ultimately empiricism falls apart. What I've observed though, when you've got multiple people being very transparent, being very open, 
they tend to be more ethical, right, okay. more moral, dare I say. Groups of people are more moral than individuals often, right, okay. you, know? Mm -hmm. you know. So, so what I, I, I mean, that's a huge assumption. I have no data to back it up. But I'm hoping that transparency will raise the bar with respect to the ethics. However, and then I hope that the speed, the ability to respond quickly, will allow us to, in the case of Fitbit, turn off certain things very quickly. Yeah. So let, let me raise the, the response up a, a level. So I, as part of my job is education in a business school in a university. So a simple question, what should we be teaching future business leaders in a world that's changing so fast? Mm. Um, and there are some basic principles of, of accounting and finance and so on. But beyond that, and to me, the, the, I don't know the answer, but the, the, the elements that I'm interested in is, can we teach people to begin to ask better questions. Okay. And a lot of that, for example, is design thinking kind of ideas, yeah. more empathetical with the, the situation they're in, mm. um, able to understand from an ethnographer point of view what's actually happening in communities, those sorts of things. So design thinking is critical. The second one is an experimental mindset. You're going to be trying more things yeah. out. The difference in my mind between an experiment and either a, just a, a test or a prototype often is a measurement system. Yeah. We have to be yeah. more empirical, otherwise we can't be experimental. Yeah. So we've got to introduce the idea of how do you measure a business experiment as opposed to a technology experiment. That's actually quite tricky. There are some ideas, but we're still working our way through. The third one for me is if we're going to think about better questions, if we're going to be able to experiment, we then have to try things out. Yeah. How are we going to try things out and deliver in complex environments? We have to have some sort of agile method that gate takes us from idea to implementation. And I think agile delivery DevOps and that automation of idea to delivery and feedback mm. is, is absolutely essential. The, the final one I think is we have to start to try to um, address some of these cultural issues, the change issues, yeah. because you're going to do that in environments where you're dealing with people. And the people have to want to change or be encouraged to change or somehow be um, taken into account as you try to do things that are different. And, and if, unless we can introduce some of these ideas, I don't see mm. how we're going to look forward. And that's why I think Scrum, that's why I think Agile is key, because many of those concepts and principles and values underlie all of that, and the specifics of the Scrum method is really the best way we know how to do this on the ground right now. It's the most really practiced, right? Yeah. And what, what's interesting, though, is that the, there's no guarantee that the cultural system, the culture, the social systems, whatever you want to call it, the behavior of organizations are able to change. Mm. So the, the, what the only organizations that really have, have adopted Scrum and an agile approach consistently are organizations that have been built from the ground up. Mm. They've started with those principles at the start right. when they're a team of seven yeah. people, yeah. when they're a team of 14 people, when they're yeah. a team of 21 people. And, uh, and though they are dealing with some serious challenges around scale now, mm. Um, that ultimately they, uh, I think they, are, I think most of these organisations are actually dealing with major challenges around identity rather than scale. Actually, right, okay. but but what we're seeing is that they're the ones that can happen. But I I hope, that, and obviously governments can't go through that transformation like that you know the, the companies do. So so I hope that that isn't the case. I hope that we can change, and that might be that certain people have to get older and leave, and right. certain people have to be, whatever reason, I, I don't know, but I, I hope that we can. Well, I think there are some things where I've seen organizations change mm -hmm. to some extent, and mm -hmm. where I've seen that, without being too dramatic, it's because sort of, they face an existential threat. Yeah. We have to change or we're dead. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was in one large telecommunications organization in, in Scandinavia that was struggling, and it, literally, they started the meeting with pictures of how nice it is, with the snow and the building. They said, we love working here, it's a great place. Let's face it, guys, those Chinese companies we're facing we're, right now, we're competing with, they're going to put us out of business in the next few weeks. If we keep working the way we're working, here's all the data. In a few weeks, we will not be here. So what would you like to do about this, guys? Keep going the way we are, and in a few weeks we won't be here, or we're going to go through a revolution. It's a choice. And essentially what they then said is, you guys are the experts, let's self-organize around how we solve this. Mm -hmm. And that was unbelievable. That was extraordinary, honestly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think that's what organizations have to do. It's interesting, I was at a large pharmaceutical company in Germany recently, and 
and they knew that they couldn't deliver the product they needed right, okay. inside their own organization. So they built a digital lab. Yep. They had an inspirational board member that protected them, that dealt with like, digital labs are great until they actually start costing money and taking time. And uh, they're like, you know, experimentation. They were really pushing the bounds of diagnostics. This is mobile diagnostics to the limit. And some of it, the technology wasn't quite there yet. Mm -hmm. So it took time. Mm -hmm. And they had a board member that had enough cap capital, <coughs> political capital to pull this off. And now they've got a whole new product to market that's probably going to change the world. Right. And, and you're like, wow. So it can, so it can happen. You're right, Alan. Yeah. I, I, they're the exceptions, not the norm. They are. Yeah, they are. And um, you know, I'm in the education business part of my time. And the right. education business is going through a digital revolution. Mm -hmm. But I look at the situation for my own organization and several others, and, and I don't think many see that immediate threat. Even though you could say, online education, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the brands of certain universities are going down, people's understanding of why am I paying this money to be educated, to go through three or four years and find there isn't a job. You go through all this and say, surely we're not going to be doing this, delivering this in the same way in five years' time. And many around me will say, yes, we are, because the systems will be the same, the way people come to universities, the expectations, yeah, and, you, and, the, and of course, yeah. the facilities and capabilities of the lecturers and the lecture theatres will be the same. So we'll be delivering the same thing. And you look at yourself and say, how, how can that be? Mm. And I think most organisations are in that dilemma. Mm. They can't you know, just flip the switch. And on the other hand, they see the edge of the cliff. Is it far enough off I don't need to worry, or do I need to move? You know, it's the who moved my cheese moment. Some, some some very interesting and, you know, I mean, just even as sitting here listening to you both talking, it's just even getting me thinking a lot more beyond what I was already thinking when I came here to start speaking to you. Who knows, right? There's, yeah. there's what we hope for and what we can try to drive for and try to create so, a change. I think, though, the point that I think, I think the human race, God, this is very deep, right? Ladies That's and fine. Women, but uh, I think the, the, I believe that the human race has an amazing capacity to solve problems. You know, I believe, you know, that that we can do anything if we put our minds to it. I think this is about choice. Mm -hmm. I think this is ultimately about choice. And so, uh, you know, when I go into an organization, they say, we can't deliver continuously because of our legacy systems. I'm like, well, that's a choice. Of course. Mm -hmm. You know, and they say, well, we can't do that because of HR. I said, that's a choice. Mm -hmm. it might not be your choice, but it's somebody's. Of course. Let's make, let's make it those people aware of the choices that they make. Mm -hmm. All we can do as mm -hmm. change agents is to make these people very aware mm -hmm. of the cha of the choices that they're making, mm -hmm. and then give them a mechanism to change mm -hmm. those cho make those ch different choices. If we do that, I think we'll be in a great place. I have every hope that that we can come together and solve these problems, and that the pa because honestly, every time we do, the world will get better. Like I, I, I was shocked. So, so one thing that you talked about, which I thought was really interesting, is the fact that. That, the, that the, you get FDA approval on something that works in a particular phone, but that phone is out of date for the time. So that phone's not even on the market by the time you get approval because it takes five years for approval to come through and yeah. most phones are got rid of in, three, in two to three, right? 18 months to, to three. So, uh, so what's very interesting is though, the FDA, which is the uh, embodiment of slow, have changed their strategy. Right, okay. So, so today we're going to market in Massachusetts that well they're doing trials for genetic altering virus driven genetic altering um, uh, basically things that will so uh, genetic blindness mm -hmm. horrible mm -hmm. unlucky thing that yeah. you're born with yeah. you're blind for the rest of your life and uh, now they have a mechanism to put that right okay. using gene therapy mm -hmm. uh, now that would have historically taken probably 20 15 years to go to market because it's fundamentally different. They're, they're using a virus to deliver a change to a genetic structure and then using some other therapies to populate that change, to it, transform that change across the thing. They managed to get that to market in you know, a few years, three okay. years, four years, which is pretty incredible. So I do believe that we have the ability to change some of these things and I think we are doing that in certain places. What worries me is that there's a, there's a mentality where people stick their head in the sand. Oh, because they're getting ready for retirement. Let's not. Do yeah, of course. It. But the yeah. point is that the, it's like every time, every time a, a child dies in India or Africa, that could have been Einstein. 
Every time we don't, we make the choice not to fix this problem, we're ultimately making the problem worse. Course, yeah. And uh, and so I think, I, but I think we can do it. Okay. I hope we can do it. Hey? Well, that, that that was really inspiring to hear. So uh, so there you hear it. Um, the world is going through change. Whether that change is ultimately for good or bad is going to be down to us to own that change. Just like Gandhi said, be the change you want to see. Uh, and hopefully, uh, the majority of us will work towards using some of these tools, techniques, and new technologies to create a better world, and be mindful of the problems that are around there, and see what we can do to be part of that solution. So, um, just in closing, because I know you've only begun to scratch the surface of some of these things, and I'm sure some of the people who are watching might want to reach out. Do you want to share some contact details on how they might be able to contact you? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, dave.west at scrum.org, I uh, always, you know, or David J. West at Twitter, you know, the usual, at David J. West. And you can get hold of me as alan.w.brown at surrey.ac.uk. Awesome. So, really want to thank you for your time. Thank you for the food for thought you've given me and the watchers. And um, yeah, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you. Cheers. Take care. Thank you.